Hi, welcome to Outlaw Bookseller with me, Stephen E. Andrews, writer, bookseller, collector, critic. And today it's kind of Mozart in mirror shades. We're going to talk about Frankenstein, Romanticism, Cyberpunk. Frankenstein is talked about a lot and rightly so because it's just fantastic we know this when Brian Aldiss sort of picked out Frankenstein centered upon it as the definitive modern motherload SF novel and he did this in his book um, Billion Year Spree back in the early 70s and it was expanded as Trillion Year Spree or was it the other way around it was Aldiss who really brought Frankenstein into the sort of corpus of science fiction criticism in a big way even though for a long time it had been recognized as an important book and there's been this really strange is it a, it's not a youtube video it's a i think it's a twitter post or something that's been going doing the rounds for a few years by um by a woman who really doesn't know what she's on about and she's saying oh mary shelley was cancelled you know she was the first science fiction writer what utter rubbish all this was talking about this in the 70s and people were talking about frankenstein as you know a key sf novel even before that so you know we'll talk about proto sf and sf before the term science fiction was coined at another time extensively but today i want to look at frankenstein and i want to look at its connections to cyberpunk through the glass darkly of romanticism i'm going to take my shades off because they're on because i like wearing my shades as you know i've usually got terrible eye bags and because you know they're very cyberpunk and um really i think the thing to begin with is to talk about um frankenstein in a sort of in a sort of cultural context really now this is a barnes and noble leather edition which is very nice and of course this is the 1831 text there are two variations there's the original 1818 text and then there's the 1831 text which was revised and altered and most people you when they first read frankenstein will read the 1831 and until comparatively recently about 30 years ago it was quite difficult to get the 1818 text and i'll talk about the differences um a bit later on but most people will i say will have read the 1831 that was the common one now the first edition of frankenstein was published i think in was it two volumes because you know novels tend to be split into multiple volumes and even if they were short and that was in 1818 the composition of Frankenstein began in 1816 and funnily enough it was mostly written and finished in Bath where I live where I'm sitting right now of course what people don't want to talk about very much is the fact that Frankenstein wasn't just the work of Mary Shelley there were other hands involved and we'll come on to that but we'll talk about the context first so if you've only read the 1831 text and I can see you all rushing out your bookshelves because of course Frankenstein has obviously been out of copyright for a very 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 long time because Mary Shelley died at the age of um, 53 and that I think was in um, 1850 I think correct me if I'm wrong so obviously it's been out of copyright a long time so there's numerous hundreds and hundreds of editions by different publishers but mostly what you're going to get is the 1831 edition most popular editions are still the 1831 now i think this was my first copy of the 1818 text this is the oxford world's classics a format paperback edition which i think dates back to the 90s this is still in print it's got a different cover now and let's have a look let's see first published in hardback by pickering and chato in 1993 pickering and chato did all of Shelley's novels which I think there are six off the top of my head in hardcover most of them had never been reissued since the, their first printings they came out they weren't successful and that was it they never came back the exceptions of course were Frankenstein and The Last Man which is a very important um, great English catastrophe novel though not a particularly good one in my opinion I'll talk about what I think is the best one in another video so yeah so this um, this edition was I think it was the first 1818 I bought and this is 1994 so still spiffing you can still get it and it's great so what are the differences well as i say we'll come on to them 
To fully understand both Frankenstein and cyberpunk, particularly William Gibson's cyberpunk, which is the definitive article as far as I'm concerned, you have to understand the intellectual sort of milieu and worldviews which were predominant in the West in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. And what we're talking about is the Enlightenment and the reaction against it, which was called Romanticism. Now, the Enlightenment really sort of began round about 1770. It's often tied in with the French Revolution and the French overthrowing their decadent royal family. Um, there's obviously a lot of awful things, awful things happened, you know, heads were cut off and the, the sort of post-revolutionary situation didn't always work out. But it was very much deemed the fact that, you know, church and state had had it their own way for too long. And there was a new rationalism in the air and a lot of the new figures who were important in the Enlightenment people like um, Diderot, Rousseau, Rousseau, what have you, lots of political writing then as well. And they decided that, you know, science was on the up and up. It was working more and more because the scientific method had really been finally reached of repeated experimentation and observation so that everything was right and you knew it worked. You know, if you repeated the experiment and everything worked exactly the same way every time. So that was really the foundation of the Enlightenment, the fact that rationalism had come into its own and the people weren't going to be pushed around by the church and state anymore. And really, we don't really have true science fiction until we have the true scientific method, until we have the Enlightenment. Of course, the problem with that, of course, is that people got very excited in those days, as they do now, about new ways of thinking. And before too long, you know, nature and humanity and everything was being sort of characterised as a kind of clockwork, as if everything happened automatically and that living things in the universe were just a machine, you know, that there was no free will, there was predeterminism. And it all seemed sort of rather staid and stiff and there didn't seem to be a lot of room for imagination. Though, of course, in SF, the imagination we see in SF comes purely from the scientific method. So we can talk about that again because, of course, science existed before the Enlightenment. When did science start? Well, let's go right the way back to before we were human beings, when we were proto-humans. Look at the apes, tool use, the application of technology and repeated methodology to get food. I mean, even crows do that. You know, they'll drop um, rocks into a glass of water to get a seed floating on the top to come drop. So you see the science technology, the application of it goes back way beyond human beings. But the actual codification of science and the method is a different thing. So the Enlightenment really sort of started to push the power of religion, magic, the superstition away. And it had been sort of collapsing for about a hundred years before that. And there's some great books on that. There's a book called Religion, Decline and Magic, which is fantastic. And you know, you can sort of read about these things. So the Enlightenment was the new thing. And everybody was very concerned um, in the sort of school of human sciences and philosophy to sort of really set out the store for the future and the way things were going to go. So the Enlightenment paved the way for the Industrial Revolution, which came decades later. By the early 19th century, the Enlightenment had been going for about 30 years on and off. And there were a lot of artists who were dissatisfied with a rather mechanistic view of the of the environment and the world and the people, which the Enlightenment was kind of forcing on people as a new kind of sort of fundamentalism. So they reacted against that with something called Romanticism, and that's with a large R. And Romanticism, I think Colin Wilson summed it up best when he said in one of his books that his favourite artists were the Romantics. And Romanticism was in painting, it was in music, so there is a form of classical music called Romanticism. Um, and also in writing, in poetry particularly, and in fiction. And the idea was that there was something bigger than science, something bigger than mankind, and that was the awe of the universe, of nature, um, of what we did know, what we didn't know, and the fact that there was always mystery in life, and that it was poetic and beautiful and sometimes scary. And the key word which summarises Romanticism is the sublime. Now, sublime is often used these days as meaning great, very, very good indeed, and I often use it myself. I'm always saying things which are sublime. But strictly speaking, the sublime is not just about beauty, it's also about terror and awe. So in the early 19th century, when young, sort of well-heeled um, young men from Britain went around Europe to look at classical civilization, they went to Italy a lot, to Venice, to the Amalfi Coast, um, Greece, Rome, all these sort of things, the sort of cultures which had fed into the whole Western stream of thinking. 
what they were interested in a lot was the sublime so they would spend time in the alps where there were huge mountains and beautiful lakes and what have you and people still do this now of course and the key sort of work of art which summarizes what romanticism is about is a painting by caspar david friedrich called usually called the wanderer above the sea of mist and it looks like this So you may think, what has that got to do with cyberpunk? Well, bear with me because we'll get to it, but you have to understand the sublime first. So as I say, that painting kind of summarizes the sublime. You see the figure gazing from the top of a mountain into the distance, there's lots of mist roiling and it's very beautiful, but it's also quite scary. And we get this at places like waterfalls, high mountains, what have you. I've experienced it myself on trips to Europe and wild places. And it's a wonderful sensation of freedom, of mystery but also it's a little bit scary as well so the sublime isn't just something that makes the heart race and brings out the poetic sensibility it's also something about to do with death and to do with fear and of something that's bigger than ourselves and this is what the romantics wanted to bring back so you take people like William Blake who was a late romantic you know they did have a religious mystical sort of thing and the Enlightenment had tried to do away with that so the clash of the Enlightenment and Romanticism produced some amazing thought and some great art. And, you know, the Romantics were often sort of poets like Coleridge, things like Kubla Khan, wonderful poem, and Wordsworth, the Daffodils poem, those sort of things, which are very gentle and pastoral. There was also some real Sturm and Drang stuff, Storm and Stress, as the German puts it, the German Romantics, E.T.A. Hoffman, people like that were really important. And it was something which revitalized the arts because there was a danger to the Enlightenment that everything sort of wonderful and magical, and I mean that in the broader sense, was sort of being leached out of our culture. So where does Frankenstein come into this? Well, of course, Frankenstein, and this is the um, Bodleian Library edition, which is entitled The Original Frankenstein. This is important to get, and I'll, I'll tell you why soon. There's no paperback edition of this, I don't think. And fundamentally, Frankenstein was born in a villa in Switzerland in 1816, a villa called the Villa Diodati, which is by Lake Geneva. And that villa was rented by the two major British romantics of that time, George Gordon, Lord Byron, who was then in his late twenties, and Percy Bysshe Shelley, who was then, I think in his early, I think he was about 23 at that point. And Shelley and Byron were firm friends. Um, they were both quite famous then, especially Byron, who was very, very famous, mad, bad and dangerous to know. And they'd written lots of poetry and Shelley's poem, Ozymandias, one of my favourite poems of all time, which is absolutely fantastic. And I've done a video about that actually on the channel and how it relates to a particular rock band. Um, they were really, really important. They were great writers. Shelley had written a couple of short Gothic novels because the Gothic was part of Romanticism as well. It wanted to bring back the mystery of horror and terror and the sublime back into literature, which I have read, I used to have OUP ones. I don't remember being that impressed by them, but it has to be said, they do have plot elements which pop up in Frankenstein. And at that point, Shelley had recently eloped with a young woman who was only 16 at the time, called Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin. Now, Mary Godwin was the daughter of the political philosopher Godwin and her mother Mary Wollstonecraft was the founder of feminism and she died very shortly after Mary was born I think it was only a matter of weeks and she wrote a book called Vindication the Rights of Woman and Godwin her father wrote a novel called Caleb Williams which is widely recognized as one of the classic novels of all time lots of political treaties as well so Mary was brought up in this very literary family and she was schooled to read politics and literature from an early age so by the age of 16 she was pretty much well read and she's very young but you've got to remember that in those days no TV no radio a much smaller press people with money or of means had a lot more time so what did they do if they read they were much better read than any of us and they were more eloquent in their speech and their writing because they focused more on language because they wasn't a mass media and that's why classics are so great and sometimes difficult to read for those of us of a more contemporary sensibility now she ran off with um, Percy, who I think had already been married, and he'd already got into trouble when he was at Oxford University for being an atheist and publishing um, a pamphlet on the necessity of atheism. And Byron has had a terrible reputation as a womanizer. He was also considered maybe to be a pederast or a homosexual. And, you know, he, he was mad, bad and dangerous to know. Very interesting characters. 
uh, Byron and Shelley. They're kind of like sort of um, the sort of Richard Hell and Tom Verlaine of their day, really. And they have, were interested in all sorts of stuff. And they were interested in Enlightenment stuff. And something they were interested in were recent experiments of galvanism, of running electricity through um, dead flesh, predominantly frogs' legs, because the discovery is being made that the nervous system, the neural system, the neuro system, was powered by electrical impulses. And they were staying there at this villa by Lake Geneva. And it was a very, very wet summer. It was summertime. And they had Byron's then girlfriend, Claire Claremont, with them as well. She was about 16 as well. So you had these two men in his 20s and these two young girls um, who were, you know, basically in their late teens. And late into the night, they would be, you know, sort of drinking, romancing, talking about literature and what have you. And Byron Shelley talked a lot about galvanism and about whether it could reanimate dead flesh and where the stuff of life came from. Something which came up on one of those nights, because they stayed in a lot because of the weather, as I say, was the fact that, you know, somebody suggested that they write ghost stories. Now, this is a famous story. It was made into a film by Ken Russell called Gothic, which is pretty terrible. But it's a famous story. And it's sort of meant to be the birth of, of horror fiction. But, you know, it goes back, way back before that. So the Villa Diodati, somebody suggested that, you know, they all write a ghost story. Claire Cl Claremont never did anything. Um, Byron wrote a little fragment, um, which has been published as a fragment of a novel. Byron's doctor, John Polidori, was there, and he was 21 at the time. And he wrote um, a story about a vampire called Lord Ruthven, which was later published in a magazine. And the magazine editor suggested it was by Byron. But we'll go into that another time. That caused a bit of a scandal. And it's where our contemporary image of the vampire as the Dracula type figure, the aristocratic figure, comes from. So it was actually inspired by Lord Byron and written by John Polidori. Shelley, I don't think, ever came up with anything. And Mary Shelley wrote how, you know, she would go to bed at night and the following morning, the others would say, have you thought of anything yet, Mary? And she'd think, no, I haven't. But one night when Byron and Shelley were talking about galvanism and whether dead flesh could be reanimated, she went to bed and she had a waking dream. And she was thinking about these issues and these ideas. And then she saw in her mind a vision of a student of the unhallowed arts standing over the body of something he'd created which was coming to life and that was the genesis of Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. Now something that used to happen a lot then of course was that a child mortality was very high and you know the Byron's and Shelley's it had several children um, Byron had many illegitimate children I say many I, I can't tell you I mean, there were a few there was only one legitimate we'll talk about we'll talk about that later on because this is important for cyberpunk and I think um, Percy and Mary had a young child who died around about that time. Um, they had another one who was born and died shortly after that. So the issue of parentage, of motherhood, of reproduction is very influential as a shadow of Frankenstein. And, you know, it's it's a really important thing. So there's all sorts of subtext of this book, as there is with any great work of literature. And that comes up again and again and again. So that was the romantic oeuvre. So these guys, they'd gone off on like a grand tour to see the Alps and the mountains of Switzerland to indulge the romantic sensibilities and to philosophize and to create more great works. And Mary's inspired as well, and as I say, because she had two famous literary parents and political parents as well. You know, the pressure was on her and Percy very, very much wanted to push Mary to write and for her to be a suitable child of her really erudite and important and famous parents. So he was sort of seminal in that. So we have to thank Percy for that. And what's interesting about this edition, as I say, this is one to get, is that this year, um, I mentioned this in another video. It's edited by somebody called Charles L. Robinson, who's an academic. And the original manuscript of Frankenstein is still with us. Now, the book was mostly written in Bath when Percy and Mary come back to Britain after being in Switzerland. Um, and it was published in 1818, an edition of 500 copies. So it was written sort of late 18, 18, 16, 18, 17. Now, what this edition does, there are two variants of the text from the extant manuscript. So the manuscript is there in the Bodleian Library and we can see the actual hands of who wrote it. Now, of course, most of it, most of it is in Mary's hand because she wrote it. However, there is a substantial portion in Percy's hand. And in this edition, the first version of the text has what's in Percy's hand in italics. You can see what he added. 
which is really interesting. A lot of the stuff is sort of like copy editing, correcting punctuation, what have you. But there are things where his stylistic flourish as a poet comes in and it's not insignificant. So really, um, maybe Frankenstein should be credited to Mary and Percy. That's a controversial view. Academics go back and forth. There's no doubt when you read the detail that Mary wrote most of it, but obviously the germ of the book and probably conversations we will never know about, because obviously they weren't recorded, and ideas could have much as come from Percy as they did from Mary, but you know, full on to Mary for, for such, and such an amazing book. And there's a second text in here, which is the manuscript without Percy's bits in it. So you see what Mary wrote originally that he crossed out and he corrected and how much of this consensual however we don't really know. Of course she got her own way in the end because in 1831 she revised it. Now the basic difference between the 1831 text and the and the um, 1818 which of course is the one represented in here is that this is regarded as sharper, more anti-religious. There are some sort of minor story details and more and more it's regarded as the definitive version and I cleave to this one as much as I like the 1831 which I've read many times since I was 14. It's one of my favourite books. Um, you know I have to say that when I first read the 1818 and looked at the notes to the close comparisons it is a lot tighter and it's a lot more cutting and it's a lot more critical of you know enlightenment ideas and romantic ideas and particularly of religion because that was a big thing for Percy because he was an atheist and he and Byron saw you know the kingdom of God as being something that had held things back for a long time and prevented the environment the enlightenment from happening so the enlightenment really wasn't the enemy to many of the romantics it just needed tempering with this feeling of awe of the sublime so really and of course Frankenstein has lots of the sublime in it you've got Walton's expedition which is the frame narrative on the ship to the Arctic and the Arctic is a naturally sublime, sublime place. He picks up Victor who's on a raft who is in pursuit of the creature and you know <laughs> Victor grows up in, in Switzerland in one of the heart, heartlands of romanticism and he's from a sort of very sort of upper class background um, a bit like the romantic poets themselves and he goes through all these agonies and you know he's a bit of an indulgent character in lots of ways and of course the creature itself is sublime it's awesome Mary says that it's seven to eight feet tall um, that it can survive in you know the frozen wastes and we see a lot of the frozen wastes in this book and often you know there's a wonderful scene where Victor and the creature meet in a cave in a high mountain in Switzerland so the sublime as it is in romanticism is perfectly encapsulated in the lightning chemical born creature and where it chooses to spend its time when it hides out in the sort of shed near to the family where it learns English and of course it learns to read but maybe that's memory from the brain and maybe it's somebody else's brain because a lot of the details about the creature is built and how it is animated or reanimated are kept from you. One, because you know you couldn't make it up and two because Frankenstein doesn't want, doesn't want Walton to know the secret of life so that nobody else can go around this terrible road that he suffers from. So really Frankenstein as well as being an indictment of child neglect because Victor is very neglectful of the creature um, as a critique of the sublime over you know the rational the dangers of science which of course is a, is a big thing and I think with science fiction I mean a lot of it is warning and we've seen it in the gothic or post-gothic mode as Aldous said in his book when he referred to Frankenstein in trying to codify a definition of SF is about how really you know I think he said at one point um, hubris clobbered by nemesis so pride destroyed by revenge and that is you know very very much sums up the creature you know and Frankenstein's hubris is destroyed by the vengeance of the creature because he's neglected it he hasn't thought about the implications of creating life just the fact that he can do it and this runs right the way through SF you know all the way through and again it reminds me of a quotation by the mathematician and philosopher Alfred North Whitehead who said it is the business of the future to be dangerous. Now to me that is possibly the best summing up of SF in one sentence that I've ever come across so there you go it is the business of the future to be dangerous. So where does all this time with cyberpunk? Well 
First of all, we'll do a direct sort of fictional link and we will talk briefly about this book here. And yes, I know you can see the microphone that um, it's all about content on this channel. The presentation will come and let's get that there. Now, this, of course, is The Difference Engine by William Gibson and Bruce Sterling, their only collaborative novel. Um, it's a steampunk novel, one of the original steampunk novels, of course, a proper one, a very, very good one. And it has lots of real people's characters. One of the major characters in this is a woman called Ada Lovelace. Now, Ada Lovelace was the only legitimately recognized daughter of Lord and Lady Byron. She was a mathematician. Now, Ada was very friendly with a scientist called Charles Babbage. Now, Charles Babbage was a mathematician as well, and he built a plan for something he called the difference engine, which would have all sorts of pumps and what have you be powered by steam and things. And it was never built. And if it had been built, it would have been massive. It'd be the size of a building. You could never get funding for it. But Babbage and Lovelace talked about the maths and what have you. And a few years ago, this is about 15, 20 years ago, um, a British university, I can't think which one, decided to take Babbage's plan for the difference engine, which was basically going to be a big calculating machine, an early computer. And they decided to build a bit of it. And they built a bit of it and it was all metal, you know, because we'd have printed circuits and stuff back in um, the Industrial Revolution in the 1830s, 1840s. And they worked it worked basically and had the difference engine actually been built it would have worked and in this novel it's built it works and it pushes the british empire and the victorian age further forward um towards you know computing power and brunel is there and all that so all that stuff that happened in the industrial revolution goes forward even further so it's a real steampunk because it goes sterling and gibson are the punk elements haha -ha. You have steampunk, you have to have real punks in it. And that's what these guys were, you know, loved underground fans, that sort of thing. So that's an important one. So Ada Lovelace, Byron's daughter, direct linked to Frankenstein via Shelley and Mary, who were his friends. So Mary, of course, was dead by about 1853. And we zip forward now to the end of the 70s, the early 1980s, to talk about cyberpunk. Now, cyberpunk. You hear it all the time. Now, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. There's hardly any real cyberpunk in the same way that there's hardly any real steampunk. Some people think it's just a collection of tropes. And I can see that. And, you know, but tropes do not a subgenre make. They go a little bit of the way. Now, if you've never read Gibson's Neuromancer, and I hope you have, if you haven't, you're in for a treat because it's fantastic. Best SF novel in the last 50 years, probably in terms of genre SF. What I would say you should read first is this book, Burning Chrome. This is the um, first edition hardcover. This is signed and Gibson signed this to me at the Worldcon back in 87. I've never owned a paperback of this. And there are three stories in this which you should read before you read Neuromancer. Now I've done a video just about this on the channel. And those three stories are Johnny Monomic, Burning Chrome and New Rose Hotel. And they are set in the sprawl, Bama, the Boston Atlanta Metropolitan Axis, where most of the action of New Romancer takes place. So you read those and you get the backstory in some of the characters, which is really, really good, because then you've got those characters in your mind when you start to read New Romancer. Now, I will admit, I hadn't read those stories when I read New Romancer, because they've been in magazines and Burning Crumb hadn't been published, so I hadn't read them. So I went straight into this. And this was the paperback I bought um, the day it came into the shop I was running in 1986. The hardcover was 1984. I acquired the hardcover, Golanx UK first, um, a bit later. And it was an A special edited by Terry Carr in the state. So I still got it. And um, this is one of my reading copies. So New Romancer. Now think of the word romanticism. Think of the word New Romancer. Think of what I was saying about the way the nervous system worked through electrical impulses, the neural system, the neurosystem, Neuromancer, and we're getting halfway there. But still, there's a big gulf. You know, Neuromancer is set 50, maybe 100 years from now. It's very high tech. It influenced all sorts of things. The word cyberpunk comes from it. So how are the two things linked? How is romanticism and its vision of the sublime and the effect of the sublime on human consciousness and artists? You know, how does that tie in with um, with cyberpunk? Well, I'll tell you, and that's an important thing. If this, these sort of elements we're talking about aren't in cyberpunk, then, you know, it's a little bit dodgy, really. And Norman Spinrad, the wonderful Norm, um, who I must do some videos about because I love his work. 
he wrote the piece, and this is way back in the 80s, and it must have been in a magazine. I've got it in a book, um, which is hidden behind a load of boxes over there, um, about how the new romantics, the new romantics, were simply new romantics. Now, when I say new romantics, we're not talking about the early 80s pop groups, though, of course, there is a connection, because if they were new romantics, and if you like pop music, they had to be old romantics. And for those of you who like rock and roll, you're probably already thinking of Roxy Music, David Bowie, Velvet Underground, The Doors, what have you. So, you know, the romanticism affected all sorts of things in popular culture, and it continues to do so. And enlightenment and romanticism are still the two sort of very interactive things that sort of war with each other throughout our culture from the beginning of the 19th century on, and it's fascinating. So, you know, there's lots of even great stuff you can read about rom romanticism, and it still affects our culture hugely. So, Norman Spinrad wrote this piece, and if you don't know who Norman Spinrad is, he was a key figure in American New Wave SF, late 60s, early 70s, and he's very friendly with people like Harlan Ellison, Philip K. Dick, uh, Michael Moorcock, great guy, met him once. He has bags of attitude, he's known for his attitude. He lives in Paris, he has them for many years. He's very popular in France, more popular in France he's ever been in America. And he's sort of a, kind of like the Norman Mailer of American SF of the 60s. And Norman wrote books like Bug Jack Barron, which is about organ farming and reality TV. And he also wrote The Iron Dream. It posits a alternative world where Hitler doesn't become overly involved in right-wing politics, but instead he moves to the USA in the late 30s and he becomes a science fiction writer. And Norman's work is very radical and very punk. Um, and, you know, he's one of the people like Spinrad and Delaney who really sort of influenced people like Gibson and Sterling in the punk element of cyberpunk. Now, basically, Spinrad's idea was that the new romantics, the new romantics, were basically nothing but new romantics. And where does this come through? And let's look specifically at new romancer. Now, if you're familiar with the book or not, I'm going to tell you a bit about the plot. And the base, this begins with a portrait of the central character, Case. And Case is a burnout. Case is a criminal in the near future world, which is dominated by corporations rather than governments. Case is a cyberspace cowboy, a hacker. He fundamentally jacks his nervous system into that of a computer um, using electrodes and his disembodied consciousness is projected into the consensual hallucination of cyberspace. The interface is there so people can enter this virtual reality of data. And what Case does is he steals data. And so he's a criminal, he, st he steals data, he makes a mistake and he steals from his one-time employer. And they take revenge on him by burning out his talent with a Russian mycotoxin. So his nervous system's damaged and he can no longer access cyberspace. And this is a major deal for Case. So we see him in Japan, dystopian Japan, and he is doing small street crime things. And, you know, he's very close to being killed in some way or another, and he doesn't really care. He's lost everything. And then he gets picked up by a woman called Molly, who's working for a man called Armitage. And Armitage says, right, we're going to get you repaired. We're going to get you into the super black clinics. We're going to resurrect that um, ability of yours to steal in cyberspace, and you're going to steal something for us. So that's the beginning of how it works. Now, more importantly, it's cases inner consciousness, and the way it's affected by the initial loss of that ability is where the romanticism comes in. And, you know, there are lines in this where Case is really missing cyberspace. And when he loses his talent, there's a quotation, it runs something like, without the bodiless exaltation of cyberspace, for Case, it was the fall. He fell into a prison of his own flesh. That's not word for word, but that's close. And Case is trapped in his body. And Gibson said that when he wrote this book, what inspired him was seeing kids in arcades, because of course computer games were primitive then. So we all used to play them in arcades and pubs and what have you, rather than at home. You know, you couldn't really do much of the sort of stuff at home. And the, the sort of microcomputer was in its infancy. And he could see the kids willing themselves to be behind the screen of the console of the game console and in the virtual world that they're playing in where they with the space invaders or what have you and of course this comes up in tron about the same time and even though tron is, is scripted quite primitively and but visually very interesting it's the same idea so in the world of neuromancer people can access this virtual reality of data and cases have this ability burnt out of him and it's, it's just killing him and he doesn't really care what happens to him and he gets his chance of redemption and 
there's another part where Case is meditating on um, sexuality and romantic attachments and there's a wonderful quotation where he thinks all the meat and all it wants. Case wants out of his body. He wants a visionary experience. He wants to experience the sublime which is inside the data net in the web life of cyberspace. So really Case and his fellow cowboys they're looking for something which is beyond. It's not just about the crime and the money and the lifestyle that goes with it. That's a byproduct. That's something that just happens. And even though they may begin thinking of the way out of the horrible dystopian corporate infected overpopulated garbage ridden environment of the future world of Neuromancer and its other two volumes in the um, cyberspace trilogy you know it begins as a, a longing for the good life you know to get the money the easy money to take off somewhere sunny and sit in the sun with them um, with a beautiful girl and a drink you know that's not what it's about for Case and his fellow sort of um, cowboys it's it's also about posing and being cool but it's mostly about that bodiless exaltation um, and Case experiences the fall and he wants to get away from the meat and all it wants and he says in it travel is a meat thing anybody can travel anywhere really quickly the sprawls really big the Boston Atlanta metropolitan access that means one huge city a technopole that runs way down the state from Boston which is in New England to Atlanta which is in Georgia it's just one city it's like the coastline of Japan where you take a train in Japan it's one city to another and it's all connected that's what you call a technopole not a term you use very much these days or you hear very much it's an interesting term so Case is looking for the sublime Spinrad noticed this straight away being a well-read man so what he was saying is that what the characters in these virtual worlds of cyberpunk are looking for is the new romanticism a new sublime experience because nature has been destroyed and there's a great moment in this where i think the characters are in istanbul it's a bad old town one of them says and there's a stuffed horse and somebody says you know they try to clone the map from the dna but they always croak nature's gone you can't experience the sublime awe and terror and beauty of nature anymore as Shelley and Byron and Mary and Victor Frankenstein and the creature did you can only experience the sublime by escaping now there's another side to this which is drug culture and of course um, case commits something like 200 odd crimes in this and at the beginning he's taking speed and what have you and of course Gibson and Sterling grew up in the counterculture age the 60s and 70s where they saw mass drug use the first time hallucinogens and people were using things like LSD psilocybin all sorts of things for expanded consciousness and to discover the sublime and interestingly this stuff is all coming back in psychotherapy Therapy. and there have been several books and TV shows which have been on in the last few years shown that you know these things were discredited in the 60s by their mass use they were used this way in the 50s to treat depression and alcohol but they've come back um, and they've been re-researched and it's pretty much been proved that these things in the correct conditions of set and setting can be really beneficial if you have mental health issues but don't do that home alone kids you know it's got to be done with professional help so we're not going to endorse anything like that so but that is something which was in the background of Gibson and Sterling that sort of seeing of the counterculture so it's that search for the sublime and the romantics always want us to look for the sublime and I guess that's what we look for in SF the sense of wonder as the old fan guys used to say in the golden age we look for the paradigm shift of new tech that causes a conceptual breakthrough so again going back to my elements of SF videos the novum the new thing the paradigm shift the conceptual breakthrough it's all there so what we're looking for in our reading really is a romantic experience of the sublime so that's my thoughts on how Frankenstein Neuromancer are, <laughs> are connected via Norman Spinrad's thinking and it just seems to make perfect sense to me so you know if you're somebody who likes romantic literature and has never read cyberpunk maybe you should if you're somebody who likes cyberpunk and you want to read some romanticism maybe you should this is a great edition of Frankenstein to get I think it bears close examination um, it's still well worth reading the wonderful 1831 which is Mary's final take on things and that's the dominant version and you can pick up paperbacks of the 1818 text as well so there's a lot in that I hope you followed it um, any questions post them below but do think about that so when you're looking at cyberpunk does it have that element of the sublime and it's even there in the dark works of people like say John Shirley if you're not familiar with John Shirley's book City Come A Walk In 
which is a very early cyberpunk novel um, in which the city of San Francisco is embodied as a sort of homunculus, a creature. It has a spirit and it does remind you of Frankenstein. Um, you know, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And, and you know, he's, he's a great writer, surely. And he was a punk rocker. He was in punk rock bands in the Bay Area. He used to call himself Johnny Paranoid. And a great guy he is as well. So cyberpunk and romanticism. Romanticism is a, a vein that runs throughout Western culture, you know, from the beginning of the 19th century and it's still really important and I always look for a bit of it myself in almost everything I'm interested in it's always there so this is Outlaw Bookseller please like subscribe comment super thanks if you want to support the channel we don't do memberships here at this stage and you know comments and queries below and enjoy your reading bye bye for now